hello to people who are joining us uh, on online and welcome to those in the room. We're getting the, the transition just right from the early service to here. We've given Keith about 90 seconds, I think, to come over and get set up. Um, so thanks for working that out. Feel free to get settled. We've got name tags here in the room, which is helpful for building little mini communities at your table. I can't promise to bring all the energy that Amy Marga brought last week, because that's Amy. I uh, hope if you were here last week, you might recall uh, her conversation with us about uh, Jesus as Savior. I am going to try to build on some of what she talked about or kind of move in some similar directions and refer to that. But if you weren't here last week or didn't watch last week online, that's fine. We'll get you all caught up. Uh, no problem at all. We're in, uh, all of a sudden, we're in week seven of this series about how our theology, how we think about God, how we talk about God, how we imagine God, uh, affects our lives, affects our relationships, affects the ways in which we approach religion in general, and maybe even approaches how we spend our time and what we consider a life well-lived uh, to look like. If you've been following along, we've got these questions that we've used as a framework, and those are on those blue half sheets on the table. They'll look familiar if you've been here before, but we've moved now to the third question, which moves away, so to speak, from uh, what God has done uh, and our own kind of problem or the problem of sin or the problem of evil to now what does a life of faith look like? And so the topic today is basically faith and discipleship, which is what you know we do at church. And it comes from the beginning of the question, will you be Christ's faithful disciple? Which looked easy, again, all of these things look easy at first glance, and then I start digging around into them and think, how are we going to get at this? And this is really the, the question of both faith, what, is it, what does faith mean? What does it mean to be a faithful person? What does faith as a response to God look like? But also discipleship, this question of what does it mean to be participating in this work or to be aligned or allied with Christ in some way, shape, or form? Uh, various ways we can think about this. The, the word disciple is, uh, at least the, the Greek word translated disciple, is a common word. It's not a Christian word or a religious word in the Greek language. It just means pupil, like a student. Uh, and the, the other thing that's interesting about the term is it only is used in the New Testament in the four Gospels, uh, in the book of Acts. In other words, it's only used in the narrative sections of the New Testament. All the rest of the New Testament, the other 22 books, use different terms to describe what does it mean to be a, a Jesus person. Never uses Jesus person. That's kind of from the 70s or 60s, right? But, uh, you know, believers or, or brothers shows up a lot, which we now render as brothers and sisters. There's all sorts of other expressions that get used. So when we hear discipleship, at least I sometimes go to the 12, you know, right, these 12 uh, guys that Jesus appointed and sent out. But we know from reading the Gospels that there's more than 12. We know it's a larger group of men and women, and then probably there are children present as well in the, the everyday life of Jesus' ministry. So what is their experience like? And I couldn't decide on artwork for this I wanted something that captures my own experience of being a follower of Jesus, and this is one of my favorites in terms of, I'm the guy hiding in the boat with the look of kind of interest, but probably also terror and just kind of hoping this goes away. Or I'm one of these people as well when Jesus is calming the storm, uh, who all look a little concerned and a little terrified and probably wish they were somewhere else. This is my experience of discipleship most days, wondering how did I get here and what am I supposed to be doing and what does it really mean to, uh, to follow this person? So faith and discipleship, that's what the question puts before us. Two caveats, though, before we go any further with that. One is we're not going to spend as much time with faith today as we are with discipleship. Maybe someday we'll come back to faith and ask the question, what is faith? And just to show you how Im important that is to talk about faith, um, Faith is a noun in English, right? What's the verb we use to correspond to the noun faith? Like we don't have a verb. You can't you can't faith in English. Belief, believe, right? We often go from faith, the noun. Faithful. Yeah, think about verbs as well, though. I mean, in terms of what's an action. Follow, have. 
right, we talk about having faith, right? It's something you either have or you don't, or you have in certain measure or maybe lack in certain measure. There you go. Trust is another one, which I think is really interesting because the, um, to go back to Greek at least, which was the New Testament was written in, the word that we often translate as faith or that we typically translate as faith also can mean to trust. And in English, the two, those two verbs, believe and trust, are pretty different, aren't they? At least in my mind, the way I use them uh, in you know, daily speech is really different. Uh, they both come, again, if we're translating the New Testament, there's a, the, the, the verb for faith or to have faith can be translated legitimately either to trust or to believe. But believe is typically something that happens in the head, right? And typically in a lot of, I would say, of post-enlightenment or even now in the scientific age, when we talk about, do you believe in God, for example, that's largely an intellectual process for a lot of people. In other words, do you believe in this thing that you can't see or touch or smell or hear, right? Do you believe in this, in this world or this being that's beyond our ordinary ways of encountering reality, right? Very much cognitive, right? Trust is a real different thing as I think about it, in terms of how you live your life. What does it mean to trust a person is a big deal and affects the ways in which I interact with that person, the ways in which I, I relate to a person. So we should, someday we should come back to this and talk about things like um, belief and trust. Uh, what about terms like surrender uh, or to rely? Reliance is also different from trust. I think it's more of a sense of handing oneself over. Uh, what do we think about faith as desperation? Um, some days that's what my faith looks like. It's less intellectual, it's less ordered, and it's more a sense of, I need to hold on to this rope, right? If I let go of this rope, I don't know what's going to happen. And a lot of the biblical characters that we encounter whom Jesus praises for having great faith are people who look like they're acting out of almost desperation. Think of the uh, the woman who's suffering from the hemorrhage for 12 years who just wants to grab on to the the end of his garment, right? Because she suffered under physicians, hasn't gotten any better, but it's grown worse. You know, this idea of a last chance. So we should talk about faith sometime as a, as a kind of a connection to discipleship, because these are connected things. We talk about disciples as people who have faith, but then you read the Gospels and you see, wow, the 12 disciples sure had a hard time responding in faithful ways. They spend most of those stories confused or in over their heads. The other reason why it's important, I think, to talk a bit about faith, or at least to flag it here at the outset, is because a lot of times we think about growing in one's faith, or we talk about faith in terms of stages, which I want to flag and just say we, we should talk about that someday, <laughs> shouldn't we? There was a famous book that was written, I think, in the 60s or 70s called Stages of Faith, which was really popular for a while. Uh, and then as uh, the book itself hasn't fallen out of favor, but that way of thinking about faith received a lot of backlash. When you talk about stages of faith, there's this implied sense of progression, right? Or if you've gone from stage three to stage four, why would you go back to stage three or God forbid stage two? You know, it has this idea of steady progress when most people describe their life of faith as looking a lot more like a stock market or like a seismograph or something like that. And so... We want to talk about that and be careful about that. Even the term spiritual growth is largely being kind of phased out of a lot of church speak uh, in favor of things like spiritual formation. Because right? again, formation can sometimes be seen as not so much a steady growth, like I used to be three feet tall, then I was four feet tall, then I was five feet tall. But again, it counts for all the ways in life where our faith changes. Uh, this matters when we think about really basic questions like, Am I supposed to sin less now than I did 10 years ago? <laughs> right? Do we expect that from people? What, is, what, do we, what counts for spiritual maturity? When we think of who gets put into positions of leadership in congregations, sometimes there's this vague sense of spiritual maturity. Well, what does that look like? And is that different from other kinds of maturity or business acumen or interpersonal relations skills? Right? What are we looking for when we think about what does it mean to be spiritually mature? Or what are the goals we set for ourselves? Sometimes those can be self-improvement plans that might not really resemble what faith looks like. So I just want to name that uh, as well. Uh, another thing too, like is doubt an enemy? If we're going to talk about faith as something that grows, 
Like, is there something wrong with doubt? Um, I don't know about a lot of you, but I can think of times in my life when doubt has been actually a, a means toward, um, I was going to use the word growing, strengthening faith, right? Or maturing in faith or discovering new things about, about faith. Anyway, that's one caveat. We're not going to have time to dig into that too much. The second thing is, where in the world is the Holy Spirit? And uh, the, the questions in front of you don't name the Spirit anywhere on them which I find a little bit interesting, disturbing maybe, uh, we should talk about the Holy Spirit some way, in some way. Because when we talk about what does it mean to follow Jesus, what does it mean to have faith, what does it mean to live a life of faith, what does it mean to uh, do ministry on behalf of Jesus, well, do we believe that God is present in empowering that in some way or do we not? So hold on to that in the back of your head, right? That there's, there's more going on here than just my will or just my desire to be a disciple. Uh, somehow, I think, the, the, most Christians believe that God is present in some way. All right, so discipleship, then. Uh, not a word we use a lot outside of the church. We use it in some other settings. But who in our world has disciples? Like, where do you hear this word used? When people like people? When you like someone, you become the disciple of somebody who's got things to say or who's popular or something like that, right? Taylor Swift's disciples had a really good week this last week. So she released an album for, okay. Who else? Just, I mean, what kind, of, what kind of people or who in particular do we talk about people who have disciples? Yeah. Dictators. Dictators or radicals, how power gets shared or how you maybe get inside of a movement. Yeah. Charismatic leaders, we talk about them having disciples. Mentors. Intellectual leaders, we talk about different kinds of schools of thought maybe, and they have their students or their disciples who then rise up and kill their teachers or, <laughs> or take their ideas in new directions. Yeah. Cults have disciples. Yeah. Any other thoughts? It's just a weird word. It's not a word that shows up outside of church a lot. And when it does, it sometimes is suspicious or it sometimes has connections to power or um, allegiance. So just to note that, um, and we'll come back to that as well. We'll talk about in particular, what does it mean then to be a disciple of Jesus? What actually are we talking about? But before we get to that, before we get to the question of what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus, I want to look at some biblical texts. I want to run through uh, seven short texts from the New Testament, which, um, which all have something to say about being a follower of Jesus. And I want you to uh, kind of hold on to the seven, or as, you, as we go through, just think about what are some things that might resonate with you, or what are some things that might strike you as either uncomfortable or disturbing in terms of how these various passages talk about what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus or a pupil of Jesus or a disciple of Jesus. Does that make sense? So we'll look at the seven, then I'll ask you, like, what do you remember? And you'll say, like, I don't remember all seven. I wish you could put them all on a slide at the same time, and I'll say, sorry. Um, but the first one is from Mark chapter one, and some of these will sound familiar to people who have spent time in church, maybe, maybe not. Uh, this is early on in Mark's gospel. <clears throat> As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon, his brother Andrew, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. All the gospels have Jesus calling followers. He initiates this kind of relationship or this kind of, you know, he's asking them to join a movement. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went on a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. That word follow shows up um, frequently, especially in Mark's gospel, to describe the people with Jesus. And what does he want from people? He wants followers, which raises the question, where is he going? <laughs> right? Where are you following him to or toward or for what end or for what purpose? And why are they doing this? Is it just that he has so much charisma or are they already aware slightly of who he is? Do they know his ideas? Right? Is this him saying, like, follow me, I'm 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 attractive, right? I'm 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 compelling. Or is this more of him saying, It's time. 
right? You know the ideas, you know what I've been teaching, it's time now for a deeper commitment or a bigger commitment or to separate yourself from something else. We don't know what Zebedee thinks of all of this, but nevertheless. Matthew 28, the very last scene in Matthew's gospel before Jesus is uh, taken up into heaven. He says this to his followers, disciples, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. A lot going on here, right? This is, again, the final words. This is typically referred to as the Great Commission. These are people who have been commissioned by Jesus to do something. Uh, and we, it, there are suggestions here that we are, or Jesus' followers, his disciples are, participating in his work. They are people who have been authorized by Jesus, right? All authority has been given to me. Uh, go, therefore. There's also a reference here to his ongoing presence. I'm with you always to the end of the age. A third passage, now we're back in the middle of Matthew's gospel. Jesus says, come to me all you who are weary and are carrying heavy burdens and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Why did I pick this? Is because so much of our talk about Christian discipleship tends to be about what we're supposed to do. What activities should you be doing? What should you stop doing? And here's one that's simply about rest or comfort, right? Belonging um, to receive benefits from Jesus is part of this. I mean, he does say, learn from me, but for the most part, right? I'm gentle and humble in heart. You will find rest for your souls. So before we do the typical Protestant thing, before we do the typical American thing and think like, what are we supposed to do, <laughs> right? What's our list of stuff, our obligations? Here's a passage that just says part of being a disciple is comfort, you know, to be found. Romans. So we've now jumped out of the Gospels beyond the book of Acts, and we're hearing from the Apostle Paul, who, like I said, doesn't use the word disciple in his writings. Again, most of the New Testament is trying to reckon with this question, what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? What does that look like in our world? Paul, in the, the letter to the churches in Rome, says this, at a, this is a turning point in the letter, I appeal to you, therefore, in light of everything I've said in the first 11 chapters, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Another way of rendering that is fitting worship or reasonable worship. In other words, this is the, the logical outcome or the reasonable outcome to everything that God has done for you that I've just talked about for 11 chapters. Paul goes on, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So here there's some connection to whatever God's will is, God's way of being in the world, what God wants from us. I think there's reference here to following Jesus as involving transformation of some kind, that we should expect ourselves as disciples to benefit from God's transforming power, uh, but also this reminder that we live in a place that's risky uh, or has potential to be a bad influence, this idea of transformation uh, and not being conformed to the world. Um, we move on. Sorry, we have chairs up front if, you, if you're willing to boldly walk to the front, which I know rarely happens in churches. <laughs> Thanks. Um, next passage. Back to John's gospel. I should point out these are in no particular order except whatever was in my mind at the time. Uh, John 13. Here's a nice disciple passage. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. This idea of what's the hallmark of discipleship? What should it look like? Is it about accomplishing things? Is it about taking over the world? Is it about accumulating power? In this place, it's about love. And in particular here, love, uh, cr the creation of a loving community of disciples, pupils, followers. Mark chapter 12, we might say, well, here's some sense of what are the, what, again, the ethics. What does it look like? This is where a scribe comes to Jesus and says, which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, the first is, here he quotes from Deuteronomy 6, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. 
The second, the guy didn't ask for the second commandment, but Jesus nevertheless, here's the second one, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater commandment, there's no commandment greater than these, Leviticus 19. What's interesting about this is Jesus is not the first Jew, not the first Jewish teacher to have been asked this question, and he appears not to have been the first Jewish teacher to give this as the answer. In other words, um, ever since, the, as best we can tell, ever since Judaism has had written laws, teachers have been trying to figure out, how do you hold all of these together? Like, what are the central ideas or the organizing principles in the law? And a lot of Jews came up with this, love of God followed by love of neighbor, right? Everything else takes care of itself if these are the paramount commandments. So the fact that Jesus gives this answer and he's part of this dialogue with Jewish leaders during his lifetime is a really helpful reminder that Christian discipleship or following Jesus is also very tied into Jewish understandings of what a life well-lived is supposed to look like. And that Jesus himself, for all of his radicalness and all of the things that we see in him that are new, is very much a Jew and is very much in line with the traditions of his people uh, at his time. And I would say even now, there are plenty of Jewish rabbis who would say this is a fantastic answer. This is the right answer to the question. Why do I put that out there? It's just to say simply that the ethics that Jesus lives by, the ethics that Jesus teaches about and promotes and that he acts out in his life in the Gospels are pretty normal. You see what I mean? It's not like he creates new visions of what goodness looks like that nobody had ever thought of before. You see what I mean? It's, you, can, you can read moralistic philosophers who will tell you a lot of the same types of things. You can find other religious teachers who will say a lot of the same things doesn't mean that Jesus is somehow less important. It's just this reminder that when it comes to goodness, when it comes to mercy, when it comes to what a life well-lived should look like, Christian discipleship hasn't cornered the market on that, right? We haven't figured out some secret approach that nobody else has thought of. Jesus might say, I did die, remember, <laughs> for the sake of this. Please don't let them forget about that. And so that takes us to the last one here. This is back to the Apostle Paul who in talking about his own experience or his own sense of identity, and he believes this is true for others too, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives within me. In the life I now live in the flesh, right? I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This idea of actually participating with God or participating with Christ, that our whole existence has somehow been taken up into Christ, or rather Christ now dwells within us, uh, that somehow we share in this crucified identity, this idea of, of the I being lost, right, or the ego being lost in some way, shape, or form in this is dramatic for Paul. This is at the heart of baptism. I mean, when you look at our baptism liturgy, right, what's going on in a baptism it's literally a dying and a rising, right? The, the, the baptismal font represents a grave. And, you know, back in the old days, or in some churches still, right, to you go down into the grave and you're brought back up. Um, that is a kind of a very Pauline, a very Apostle Paul way of thinking about identifying with Christ. All right, so those are some verses just to kind of, you know, turn your, your creative juices here. So back to that question, what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus. Um, no whiteboard today, so we're going to try to do it this way. I just put a couple up here that I thought would maybe come out of the, the seven passages. These don't correspond exactly to all of them, but part of it is to be a pupil, to, be, to learn from Jesus. Part of it is to follow Jesus. The question is, where is he going? Some of this language is about collaboration, doing the same work that Jesus did. Uh, to believe is that is does it mean to be a successor, right? To take up the mantle of his work. Uh, imitation is sometimes talked about what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus or just to participate or just to belong. Again, this is just, these are things I thought people might say, so I would say them first here on the screen. What else do you hear in those 11, uh, no, sorry, in those seven passages or what other kinds of maybe adjectives pop up for you or short descriptions? See what I mean? This is different from being a disciple of you know, name your favorite cult leader or name your favorite thought leader. What does it mean to be a disciple in particular of Jesus based on what we've just seen or other kinds of ways you've been conditioned? Bill. 
a willingness to be transformed. Yeah. So that the assumption is somehow I'm a different person or aspects of me are changing than they were in some way prior to God's action or if I were left to my own devices. Is that fair? Okay. Like a branch or an outshoot of Jesus himself. Yeah, it's interesting. So in John's gospel, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches, right? This idea that we have a kind of organic connection in some way. Fascinating. Yeah, please. To be the hands and feet of Jesus. The Lutherans have got, have, the ELCA has a great it's like a slogan that they've been using for the last decade. I think it's God's work, our hands. That maybe tries to encapsulate that a little bit, right? This is the ministry of God, but we're the ones who put it into practice, so to speak. Is that fair? A fair way of taking that? Yeah, please. Sure. I like that. So for people online, it's an action step. It's, 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 it's involves doing something or being in the world in a particular way. Would it be fair to say that a disciple can't just be somebody who just sits alone with their thoughts all day and not that there's anything wrong with that, but you know, that, where is that going to take you? Where is that going to lead you? But even I, I I'm going to correct myself. There are some people who sit alone with their thoughts all day who are probably doing good for the world. <laughs> are you going to correct me, Kathy? Yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, Kathy said for folks online that listening is an important part of discipleship. Spending time with God alone is an important part of discipleship. Sure. Uh, we'll just kind of, I'll, I'll ride the wave from your left. Sacrifice and courage were a big part of being a disciple. And you said in certain times in history and in some, yeah, right. Right. Certainly those early years in a lot of cultures still today, it takes a lot of sacrifice. <laughs> yeah. Took a lot of courage. You're confronted with Roman authority. Some people probably lost their families as a result, probably were thrown out of households at different times, just look weird to some people, might have lost business, friends, things like that, which is interesting to think about. I have somebody who has never, as far as I can tell, never suffered any kind of loss or pushback from being Christian in my life. Um, and yet we read in the New Testament, it's, it's entirely written from the perspective of kind of the underdog, right, or people who feel like they're at, 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 at under threat in some way. So how do I read those texts in ways that are authentic to my experience, but to theirs? Yeah, I think we're just kind of moving this way. I think Rocky was next, and then we can go to Mark. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. The priesthood of all believers is a great Reformation term that Calvin glommed on to. It was really important for Luther as well. Part of that was pushback against Roman Catholic hierarchy. You don't, quote unquote, need a priest to encounter God. But also this way of saying all believers have the same capacity to be, not just to meet God, but to help kind of mediate or assist or minister in that relationship that we all have. And our vocations matter as a way that, that discipleship doesn't mean you have to grow up and be a priest or a monk or, God forbid, a New Testament scholar. But... Um, Right, that, that God is served, that a discipleship functions in every aspect of life if you understand it as a calling in some way. Great. Yeah, Mark.
Yeah, thanks. Yeah, Mark points out that this idea of being a pupil often means, can you raise up students? <laughs> can you nourish students who might push your ideas, move your ideas to another level? And so what does that mean to debate with Jesus or to reason with Jesus about? Which sounds scary to some when you think like, but he's Jesus. And he does say things like a disciple isn't above his master. At the same time, I think we can look back and say, are there aspects of Jesus' life that perhaps he maybe he himself has set us on a trajectory toward change and right he did pick 12 male disciples people always ask why did he pick 12 men i say i don't know i don't want to get part of that. don't ask me to defend that but part of that is surely cultural at the time um do i wish he would have picked you know a perfectly representative group of 12 <laughs> uh absolutely but he didn't as far as we can tell and so what is but does that mean that we're doing something wrong today? I, I don't think that's true either. You know what I mean? So I wonder if there are ways in which, as we think about how does Christian faith look in different cultural settings with different kinds of values and different understandings of what does it mean to be human, we are in some ways, I don't want to say correcting, maybe pushing beyond or taking his ministry to a more a, a reasonable outcome, perhaps. Is it my butchering everything you just said, Mark, or am I trying to, trying to build on it? Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, Sam, and then we'll work back. Have a Yeah. Just for people online, the comment was about how resistance is part of this, too. It's not all just positive terms, but what does it mean to be, to live in the world but not be of the world? And, and I think you, you referenced, too, Sam, that's a, that's a hard line to find sometimes. Is that fair? There are some Christians who seem to just think relish being obnoxious, I think, is their way of doing that, but none in this room, of course. We'll just, I, we have time for one more. So we'll. Hmm. Yeah, the question was around, or the comment was around in Matthew 28, what does it mean to make disciples? And is that, how is that our responsibility? What does that look like? Okay, we'll do one more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, the comment is about be, care, be careful about defining discipleship too closely and recognizing other people are engaged in other things. And um, indeed, I think I mentioned earlier, you know, so much of the New Testament is about the Gospels, where we spend a lot of our time. Who was Jesus? What did he say? What did he do? What was compelling about him? Much of the rest of the New Testament, what does it mean to live in response to this person? And a lot of that is about navigating difference <laughs> and disagreement. And so I mean, this is why Paul 
gets to write letters is because his churches are misbehaving all the time, right? It'd be nice if he wrote more letters like, everything's going great. Uh, don't change a thing. But, you know, almost, yeah, it's so, <laughs> isn't this great? Uh, it's about navigating some of that, right? You think it's supposed to be this way. You think it's supposed to be that way. You have these gifts. They have those gifts. And yeah, discipleship would be a ton easier if you were all just carbon copies of me. That's not just Paul, that's Matt also saying that. You know what I mean? It's just, um, and the history of the church bears that out, doesn't it? We're always dividing and reuniting and, <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, not to assume that somebody else is in the same place that I am. Um, it takes us back to those stages, right? And how how dangerous it can be to imagine that it's a steady line, you know. And so I'm at stage 28, and so anybody beneath me, I have to, you know, be condescending toward or something like that. I mean, that's, obviously, it doesn't work that way. Um, we'll come back to this at the end, just to highlight this. What does it mean if we talk about all this in more communal sense than individual? What if my own identity as a disciple is less about me and what I can do and how much I pray or whatever, and more about how our community together nourishes a kind of communal faith? It's obviously both and, but we sometimes think about this in strictly individualistic terms because, well, in part, we're Americans, right? We all believe in individual responsibility and everybody gets graded and ranked on their own, you know, but. What if we go back and look at all of those passages again and, and read the plural in all of that, right? The, the, how they're addressed to communities. All right. Last week, uh, Amy Marga was here. If you, some of you were here. Some of you might have seen it on video. Some might not know what we're talking about. And she talked about Jesus as Savior. And she talked about these various stages in the Gospels uh, or aspects of, of the life of Jesus, his birth or his incarnation where God becomes human. Uh, the life he lived, the ministry he performs, uh, his death, his resurrection. And she asked the question, you know, where does God save? And what happens if we locate the work of God or the reconciling action of God in just one place and kind of how that matters? And the feedback I got was quite positive. Everybody wants her back. Couldn't get her this week. Um, and I have to teach sometimes. But uh, I want to I want to pick up on 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 what she did, looking at these four stages. And when we talk about discipleship, we might even want to talk about things like the Ascension or Pentecost, right? Places where there's a transformation or where God empowers us to do or to be certain people. But I want to talk about ways in which um, these all connect when we think about discipleship. Like I asked, you know, following Jesus, but to where? Um, well, he doesn't end up in power, does he? Are we following him to the cross? Are we following him to the ascension? Are we following him to the second coming? I mean, what's what does he mean when he says, follow me? And how will we know when we've gotten there? Um, right? Is discipleship about imitating Jesus, mostly in his life and his ministry? Uh, is it about obedience, like dying on a cross and the sense of a death to self? Uh, is it about living into newness? Is it all about resurrection and imagining new things uh, beyond? We could probably find ways in which we see all of these connecting to our sense of what does it mean to be a disciple, and that's good. I don't think we want to pick out just one of these. Um, for example, if we just talk about the incarnation of Jesus, right, where God becomes human— we might lose our sense of what's particular about Jesus. You know, in other words, if we say, well, um, everything's holy. So I, I was teaching another church about a month ago, and they're taking a trip to Israel and Palestine, and uh, one of my former students is going, and she asked me to come and, and talk about the Holy Land. And so I started off saying, what's a holy place for you, right, American Protestants? And of course, the first answer was, every place is holy because God is everywhere, which is not a bad answer, but it's right. It's <laughs> but somewhere Roman Catholics and, and Orthodox are just like ah, oh. <laughs> just like silly Protestants. Um, 
Yeah. I was like, well, if every place is holy, does that mean no place is holy? I mean, what does it mean to be? So anyway, just kind of, if our discipleship is largely based on, well, God is everywhere, God became human, then do we lose some particularity in this? Uh, if our if our discipleship only imagines the ministry of Jesus, and it's just about imitating him in terms of his compassion and his love and his self-giving, we might have a theology that becomes just ethics. What I mean by that is it's just about behavior. It's just about doing good. And we've lost a sense maybe of where does the empowerment of God come into here. We might also get really discouraged because I don't know about you. I don't have anything close to the capacity to live a life like Jesus lived his life in terms of attentiveness to the other. Maybe as a community, we can do a little better, but I think we're still going to maybe fall short. Uh, death, a lot of discipleship talks about death and the crucifixion of Jesus, right? I have been crucified with Christ. That type of language, there's a way that can, if, if that's all we talk about, where does that take us, right? We can get to scapegoating, we can get to the point where we start to glorify victimization, uh, those types of things. If anybody's ever come to you in a bad place in life where you're suffering emotionally or physically and said, what are you learning about God in your suffering? Um, right? You're, you have permission to yell at them. Um, <laughs> right? There are <laughs> people come to that understanding. If you watch the summer series on um, faith in the flesh, you might remember Vivian Jenkins Nelson's uh, conversation about coming to a deeper appreciation or understanding of God in her life through her own experience of chronic suffering. That's great. That happens for a lot of people. That doesn't mean everybody who suffers gets there, right? Or that it's uh, ways in which um, people who suffer abuse are congratulated for being able to share the sufferings of Christ, right? There's a way in which this can encourage victimization, and maybe some of you uh, have experience with that in, in hopefully other congregations uh, as well. Uh, resurrection, if all we talk about is new life and victory, do we risk sliding into a theology of wellness or a theology of prosperity, right? Or a theology that neglects this life and the, the struggles of, of this life. How do we hold all of these together in some way, shape, or form? I think it's important because I think the crucifixion of Jesus is a reminder that Jesus' life has consequences. They don't kill him because they didn't have another choice. <laughs> right? They killed him because they're trying to send a message. They don't kill him because... Um, they thought he was insignificant, right? They kill him because what he's doing has such implications for their understanding of how the world's supposed to be ordered. Uh, and the fact that his ministry leads to a death is a reminder of how much risk is bound up, right, in the kind of life that he lives. In other words, when the Gospels describe the death of Jesus, uh, Amy said this last week, right? It's not that he was born just so that he could die, in other words, all of those chapters about the teaching and the ministry and the controversy aren't just to reassure us that he was really a nice guy who didn't deserve to get executed, right? These are passages that say that a life lived like this is bound to, ar to arouse the opposition uh, of people with power. So that's interesting, right? That we can't just say the life of Jesus is all about, or the ministry of Jesus is all about life-giving action while his death is about suffering. Uh, I think we want to pay attention to the imperial context here. This was mentioned, too, about the danger of the Christian confession in the first century, the danger of being Christian. What does it mean that Jesus dies as a victim of, of an empire? What does his crucifixion say about humanity? Us, right? Our systems, our values, the way we push back against God. What does the crucifixion say about God's own commitment right, to see through a new vision for a new way of being in the world. Does that make sense in terms of where I'm going? Like when we talk about what does it mean to imitate Jesus or to participate with Jesus or to follow Jesus, there are ways in which all of these aspects of his existence matter for that. Any thoughts on that? Anybody want to weigh in on kind of what that looks like? I mean, you could, you could talk about benefits and, and, and risks of, of all of these, right? A, 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 a Discipleship formed by the crucifixion has a, is a great way of controlling people, <laughs> if that's what you want to do as a religious leader. It also has a great way of talking about self-sacrifice and about acknowledging the ways in which uh, the, the, the world is a broken place.
Yeah, please. Yeah. No, it's a great comment. So it, the, if I can offer a brief summary for folks online, that what is what are the death and re, what do the death and resurrection mean apart from the fact that his life has consequence or his life has value, right? But also, so much of the gospels are dedicated to the teaching, the ministry, the life. What do we do with? the death and how do we know that that's quote unquote meaningful when most of the commentary about that comes from other voices in the new testament is that kind of a fair encapsulation i don't know if it's better but uh uh or maybe i'm leading you a certain direction but i um we'll come back to that more in, in a minute or so but you're quite right um in terms of what the Gospels emphasize. I mean, all of the Gospels have Jesus talking about his death. Some of them say a lot more about what's significant about his death than others. Um, historically, right, what do we know about this person? <laughs> um, historically, I think we, we know pretty good confidence that he dies not just as um, as a victim of violence, but somebody who dies from crucifixion. And so that also opens up really interesting questions about what kind of people were crucified by the Romans, right? And so then you get questions of, well, he was clearly perceived as dangerous. He was clearly perceived as somebody whose life had no value, right? So all of that also kind of gets folded into what does it mean to be a crucified teacher in Jesus' perspective? I'll come back to that more in a minute. That's kind of a, a teaser, but other thoughts on these? Yeah. Yeah, um, the thing that Mark really is bold, right? <laughs> Mm. Yeah. Yeah. The point here was about how does discipleship involve bringing hope? So reference to the Presbyterian disaster relief out of chaos, hope. That's one of their mottos. Um, and so where does that play itself in? How does discipleship do that? Um, that's interesting, right? Resurrection might be part of that. I mentioned, you know, we could probably add to this slide things like Ascension and Pentecost, like the giving of the spirit. And what is that? signify as well. Um, how is Jesus' own ministry about hope and, and, and bringing hope and bringing new life into places where people appear to have been forgotten or overlooked? So, yeah. yeah.
Yeah, thanks, Kelsey. It was uh, the comment, which I can't summarize. <laughs> is this kind of a disconnect between the privilege that most of us live with today and what the New Testament reports about what discipleship looked like back then um, and how we navigate that and and this maybe this desire to self-sacrifice or to self-giving, but also acknowledging that's been used in some really perverse ways in some Christian circles is that, and, and still is. Like I said, Discipleship based solely on the cross is a great way to control people if that's your aim, <laughs> which is not. I hope you all know me that well enough, but um, and we'll come back to that in the few minutes we have remaining, right? But that's part of it. And I think, too, with that, even if you don't want to control people, comes a certain victimization narrative that we hear a lot in this culture as well, right? Christmas is coming. You're going to hear about the war on Christmas, right? The culture out there hates us Christians. That's why there's this war on Christmas. And you're like, what are we talking about? You know, it's this desire to be in the victim's role because of the power that exists there as well in, in some settings. So one more, and then I got to move on. <laughs> ah! <laughs> What's the grain of truth? Yeah, what's the grain of truth that promotes Christian nationalism? Sure, I think it's, well, I think there's several grains of truth in there. And one is that the world is a fallen place and there's, a, there's a, literally a war going on, a spiritual war going on for the sake of the world and for our children. Do not edit this video, Keith, in a way that like makes me look crazy. <laughs> I can see the clips now. Right, and, and you need to choose a side. Right? Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, Romans 12. But then you become the one with the power in this war and you're the one who's now uh, doing battle with these dangerous forces out there, and you use every weapon at your disposal, and that weapon, in this case, is a nation with its laws and its military. And so I think that's the the grain of truth that gets blown up into a kind of arrogance of, I must be right, everybody else is now a suspect, and everybody else is now a threat. So um, thank you for not editing that. <laughs> Because I haven't disavowed Christian nationalism today, let me do that. So, all right. And Kanye West, too, just because everybody else is getting on board with that. Anyway, what a week. I want to close up by making a quick case for what's been coming up in some ways is talking about what does it mean to speak about Christian discipleship as, as what I'm going to call cruciform discipleship. Or in other words, discipleship that corresponds to a cross or cross-shaped discipleship. Um, all cards on the table here because I don't want a discipleship that's just about ethics. I don't want a discipleship that's just about um, doing good. Not that I'm against doing good. I think that's what it looks like. But it quickly makes the church really nothing more than any other good social service organization out there, which are all doing good things. I just want to know what's distinctive about church. Why do I have to set my alarm for Sunday mornings to be good? Uh, <laughs> Sorry, I don't like mornings. Um, you see my point here, like, where is God involved in this? Or what's distinctive about being Christian? Not better, right? Because I'm all for the ways in which we partner with people of other faiths and people of no faith for a better world. But when it comes down to, why are you Christian? What is it about the Christian view of a life well-lived or a Christian view of what does it mean to, um, to participate with God and God's work in the world? Where does that come down to Jesus? And I want to say it's not just about the cross, not just about his death, but I don't want to lose sight of what that looks like. Um, and so here's a great discipleship verse, great in the sense of it's got quite a history. This is in Mark's gospel. Jesus has just announced to his followers for the first time that this story is going to end in death, where he says, you know, by the way, um, I'm going to be arrested and killed and, and then three days rise from the dead. He hasn't mentioned anything about a crucifixion, hasn't mentioned the word cross yet in Mark's gospel. He said to the crowd <clears throat> with his disciples, so everybody who's following him, and said to them, if any want to become my followers, there's that word again, 
let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. So anyone want to become my followers, here are your three imperatives. Deny yourself, take up your cross, follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. Deny yourself, take up your cross, follow me. Um, for John Calvin, he described this verse, he described self-denial as the sum of Christian life, uh, which, which I kind of like, this idea of self-denial. But we have to define what self-denial means and what it looks like, right? Because this can be weaponized, can't it, right? Deny yourself, right? Your rights don't matter. Your complaints don't matter. Your suffering doesn't matter. I'm sorry you suffer abuse, right? This is what God has chosen for you. You can hear those. Some of you have tapes that play those messages way too loudly in your heads, I imagine. What does self-denial look like? It doesn't mean that your life is of no value or of no purpose. In the ancient world, this was largely about household, right? One's self or one's identity, what we in our world would talk about selfhood or the ego, was very much kind of familiarly defined, right? It's to whom you belonged, who your people were. I think this is part of a bigger imagination in the Gospels of Jesus seeing his movement as a new family, as a new organization, as a new social structure. It's one of the reasons they kill him, right? Because in a society where the the social life and the economics are made up around households, it's really dangerous when Jesus says things like, if you want to follow me, hate your mother and your father, right? What in the world is he talking about? Deny yourself. Second thing, take up your cross and follow me. Well, what does take up your cross mean when Jesus first utters it to these people? This is more than just undergo some kind of um, discomfort, right? It's not a general appeal to suffering, I can't think of the right kind of analogy for an R world, but it's been proposed, others have proposed things like take up your electric chair, right? Or face your firing squad. I mean, a particular kind of way of dying. When you think of something where just the image evokes a particular horror, right? Think of Abu Ghraib. Remember the, the prison in Iraq where, the, where, um, where prisoners were tortured uh, and the images that came out of that? I mean, for Jesus to say something like, right, you want to deny yourself, right, check into Abu Ghraib and follow me, something like that. It's something so horrifying when he says, take up your cross. Do you see what I mean? He's not talking about suffering in general. He's not talking about pain in general. He's talking about a kind of renunciation or a kind of death that indicates a kind of subversion on his part. Right? indicates his rejection from the powers that be. It's the kind of death that's not just excruciatingly painful, but the kind of death that labels somebody as an outsider in the Roman world, right? as somebody whose life has no value, as somebody who is perceived to be a danger to the empire. The Romans didn't crucify their own citizens. They didn't crucify anybody with any kind of social status. They crucified slaves. They crucified people who we would call uh, terrorists today, they crucified people who were determined to subvert the values of the empire. Right? So there's something deeply political, there's something deeply subversive about him talking about death on a cross. If Jesus is God, it also represents a kind of really, really radical solidarity on God's part with the least of this world, right? the people whose lives are viewed as being of no account. In other words, when Jesus says, take up your cross, we want to read that in all of its social context, all of its political context. He's not talking about suffering in general as being good, or he's not talking about wasting one's life, right? He's talking about ways in which you get yourself identified as a danger to the powers that be. I don't want to pretend that my saying this on a Sunday morning in a really comfortable church on a lovely Sunday morning is somehow equivalent to that, right? But it's part of this, this disconnect, I think Kelsey was talking about, between how radical this looked in the first century and what that looks like for us today. But for this to get translated into, uh, you know, your disability, I actually be good for you, right? Or the abuse you suffer, that's great, that reminds me of Jesus. That's a perverse way of taking what I think was a really particular way of talking about suffering and somehow generalizing it to involve all suffering. The New Testament has a lot to say about suffering, about persecution, about hardship, and one of the biggest mistakes we can make is to equate all of that, 
right, to imagine that all suffering of any kind is the same. When the New Testament celebrates people being persecuted or undergoing hardship, it's precisely about the kind of hardship that results from their identification as a follower of Jesus, right? Which is really different from getting beat up in the alley one day or something like that, right? This is real, it's not about just random or meaningless violence or suffering. Does that make sense in terms of what's branded? This is the power, I think, of the cross as a symbol, which is why it's so crazy that it's become, you know, this, <laughs> it's become a, a ubiquitous symbol, right? But it's an ugly, ugly symbol from the perspective of a first century audience, right? It's a horrific symbol of rejection of, of, um, of again, of political subversion. So Jesus says that, which takes us to James Cohn, who um, who's, was evoked last week uh, as well, and his book, uh, The Cross and the Lynching Tree, which is this beautiful book. I think it's the last book he wrote before his death, where he... Um